My name is Martin Adi, I'm working at CERN, and I'm one of the developers of the Monte Carlo code MoFlow. And in this first uh, episode of our series of web tutorials, we will see what Monte Carlo simulations can be used for, and what are the alternatives, and also a little bit about the history of the code MoFlow. So here at CERN, we've got several accelerators, and maybe the most known is the LHC, where we've got a really low pressure, and the reason for having a low pressure is that we'd like to collide particles with each other, whereas if we had some residual gas in the system, then particles would actually hit those and we would have some beam losses before they actually collide with each other. So uh, we express the pressure in units of millibars most often, and uh, a typical pressure for the LHC would be 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 millibar which is less than millions of a millions of the atmospheric pressure. So here is the schematics of the LHC. We've got dipoles and we've got some interconnections in between. And to achieve the low pressure, we put pumps at certain distances from each other. So this will be a simple vacuum system. Obviously, we don't show you the full picture because even what we mark as a single pump here would be a pumping group in reality. So uh, that would consist of two different pumps, one for the high pressure and one for the low pressure part. Then we've got also gauges for different domains of the pressure. We've got several valves, and if you look at the schematics of this pumping group, then we can see that we've got several devices and valves and ports to do some venting, lead detection, and bake out. My point is that the vacuum system is usually quite complex. It's got uh, it's a long series of pipes with several different types of pumps. And we would like to simulate them to predict the pressure and to do engineering calculations and design to, to keep a good vacuum. Now, traditionally, uh, gases, they uh, act like a fluid, which means that you've got many collisions between the molecules. Uh, also, you've got some wall collisions, but they don't dominate. This is important because if you perturbate the system, for example, you start pumping from one of the corners, then immediately all the molecules will uh, feel this effect and they start flowing to, uh, towards the exit. However, in high vacuum, the molecules act independently of each other, which means that you cannot pump at one location. You have to catch these particles one by one. And this is usually uh, harder to uh, do than uh, putting simply a powerful pump at one location. So here the physics is somewhat different, and uh, for that we need a different simulation tool. Now, there are several ways to calculate high vacuum. The first is the analytic method. You've got two governing equations. One is telling you that the pressure, marked with P, is higher if your gas input, marked with Q, is uh, high. So if you put more gas into the system, you've got larger pressure. And pumping is keeping a balance with the gas input. The higher uh, your pumping speed is, the lower pressure you get. Then you've got the gas throughput with, at the second equation, which tells you that basically if you've got a pressure, dif pressure difference, then gas is flowing from the higher part, higher pressure part to the lower pressure part and the rate of this flow from high to low pressure is determined by the conductance which is a geometrical property and it's telling you like how fast gas can react to a pressure difference. If the conductance is high, which is typically the case in uh, thick pipes, then gas is flowing fast. In case of thin or long pipes, the conductance is lower and then the pressure flow is lower as well. So, using these two equations, you can already solve a system similar to the theoretical accelerator we have shown a few slides ago. So, let's assume that you get a uniform outgassing coming all along the wall. We've got periodic pumps placed in the accelerator, and we would like to calculate the pressure at uh, one point. So, to do that, we use the differential form of these two equations, and then you can do a so-called back of the envelope, so a very short calculation. And the solution of this differential equation is like a parabolic curve, which is telling you that the gas pressure is the lowest at the points where you are pumping, and as expected, is the highest when you are the farthest away from the pumps. Now, obviously, to use these calculations, you need to know the conductance. 
So there exists a catalog for common geometric shapes, such as pipes, cones, like uh, square cross-section parts. But you can have irregular shapes where it's very hard to calculate a conductance, or simply you can have a series of uh, elements which are really complex and then it's really hard to analytically define what the conductance from one point to the other would be. So to treat so, uh, such complex systems, you can use the Monte Carlo method. And the idea can be demonstrated when we are calculating the area of the circle. So basically the circle has an area uh, of the radius square times pi. And pi is a number which can be approximated by 3.14, but obviously it's got uh, unlimited digits. And to calculate those digits or calculate the exit value of pi, you've got several methods. One is geometric. You uh, approximate the circle by polygons, where you've got an exact formula for the area. And if you have polygons of not so many sides, then obviously the difference between the inner polygon and the outer polygon is quite high. As you start to increase the number of sides, you've got better and better convergence towards the actual number of pi. You've got also some analytic methods. You can use an infinite fraction to calculate the value of pi or like a sum of a series or the product of a series. But all of them require relatively long calculations and at one point you need to simplify your methods. So one of the alternative ways to calculate the area of the circle is to uh, draw simply a circle in a square and then uh, put random points on your screen or on your paper if this is a, uh, in drawing. And then you can say that the number of points inside the circle marked with red on the left uh, relates to the number of all points as the area of the circle to the square. So that, uh, by counting the number of points, you can actually approximate uh, one-fourth of pi. Obviously, this is not too precise at this moment, but if you keep adding more and more points, then your result will actually converge to the real number of pi. So to recap, Monte Carlo methods can solve difficult analytic problems by a random-based uh, approximation. And an alternative to this method is the Monte Carlo method, when you're actually uh, drawing the circle, or like one quarter of it in this case, you randomly put dots, which equals to, for example, uh, taking a handful of sand and just putting it on the paper. And then you count how many points you've got within the circle, uh, as opposed to the total number of points. So in this case, like if you take the ratio of the points inside and all the points, then you get one fourth of the number of pi. Now obviously this method is not 100% uh, accurate. However, as you start to increase the number of the points, the number that you calculate will converge uh, pretty well to the exact value of pi. So a summary of the Monte Carlo method could be that you've got an engineering problem which is difficult, but you can solve it with a way where you've got a large uh, number of random numbers. You don't need the exact solution, just an approximation. And obviously for this to work, you need a good random number generator. So if you want to do simulations of vacuum with this Monte Carlo method, then instead of calculating the area, you need to get a model of the system. In Moonflow, the system is always represented by its two-dimensional boundaries. So we only care about surfaces and not the volume in between where particles are flying. We can make this assumption because in ultra-high vacuum, we assume that the particles don't collide with each other within the volume. And then, once you have the geometry, so the walls, you have to input some gas. Now, typically, even for like a relatively small uh, gas input, you would have 10 to the 20 molecules uh, entering the system every second. And even today, it's quite powerful computers are not fast enough to simulate all of them. However, we assume that all the molecules behave the same way. So if we have a smaller number that we can actually simulate, then simply we have to keep track of how many we have actually simulated, how many there would have been if in the physical world, and the results that we get, we upscale to the physical solution. 
So once we got the gas in the system, we can do ray tracing, which means that as the particles are flying straight without an interaction, they will only collide the next wall element. And once they do that, they reflect. Now, as opposed to like rubber balls, which is a good analogy to a vacuum system, uh, the reflection is not uh, specular. So it means that if you've got an incident direction, the molecule will stick to the wall for a few microseconds, do thermalization and some thermal vibrations, and then it gets re-emitted. And by the time it happens, it loses its memory of where it came from. So the probability of the reflection is following the Lambertian principle. So it's the most likely that you will leave the surface perpendicular to it. However, there is a decreasing probability that it will go in other directions. So our random generator needs to choose a new direction following this distribution. Now, the particles stay in the system until they are being pumped. And typically, when you purchase a vacuum pump, its uh, pumping speed is given in liters per second or cubic meters per second. And there is a physical uh, equation to convert that into so-called sticking probability. So sticking probability or capture probability tells you uh, how probable it is that a molecule hitting that surface will get out, will get pumped. It depends uh, on the surface, the average molecular speed, so it depends on the gas type and the temperature, and the rest is you have just to plug into the equation to get the number. So here is a small Monte Carlo simulation. I'm launching a particle from the gas inlet. It's doing some random uh, bounces, and then it came back to where it started from. However, another molecule, which is also doing a random walk, can eventually find its way to the exit. So, for example, if my simulation was about determining how, much par how many particles get to the other side, which is called transmission probability, at this point, uh, generating only two molecules, it would be like 50%. Obviously, we repeat this procedure to uh, several millions of times. And then, even in this irregular shape, that was almost impossible to uh, calculate the transmission probability or conductance uh, analytically. We, our Monte Carlo methods uh, give us an exact answer. So Monflow is taking this principle. The name is the abbreviation of molecular flow. It was written by Roberto Carson in the 1990s, originally in Turbo Pascal for those systems. And starting from 2008, there was a modernization process to use modern multi-core uh, processors to calculate faster, make it a colorful Windows-based user interface, and uh, to make a website. Recently, Moflow was ported to Linux and Mac systems as well. So typically, if you're an engineer using Moflow, you would have the CAD geometry coming from an external source. Later, we will see that it's even possible to build your own geometry within Moflow to some extent. Now, old CAD programs can save in STL format, which is a list of triangles, and that's uh, usually included for 3D printing, which also uses the STL format. And once you have that STL file, you can import it in MoFlow. So when you have uh, your geometry in MoFlow, you uh, basically have to select parts of it, which we will call facets, and those facets can have physical parameters. So Basically, you add physics. You define where the gas is coming from, where the gas is going to, and you have other properties that you can define, such as temperature. And that's it. Basically, if you have the geometry and you've got the physics added, then you can launch the simulations. And here, the green path show the uh, the green lines show the path of the molecules, and some post-processing tools allow you to see a color map of your pressure and also like profile, which is like the pressure along a direction. Now here you can see that after uh, having simulated 100 molecules, uh, we've got a few hits, but obviously we get a lot of statistical noise. But as the Monte Carlo simulations advance as you've got, and you've got more and more particles, the results start to be uh, extremely well converged. So basically, MoFlow is uh, bouncing molecules and tracing them in the system. It's not giving you a deterministic result, but one with some randomness. 
However, with a large enough simulation time and large enough simulated uh, number of molecules, you can get a very good approximation of the pressure uh, distribution in your system.